The following is a brief discussion of recordings of detectives on the Sarah Boone case interviewing her ex-husband. The first interview takes place on scene. The second is a later follow-up phone call. I did alter the pitch on the audio in the first interview to make it easier to hear. And the child's name has been redacted. Let's go. Today's date is February 24th, 2020. The time now is partially 15.25 hours. This is in reference to Orange County case number 20-017904. I am currently located in my unmarked agency vehicle in front of 4748 France Lane, apartment number three in Winter Park, Florida. Um, also in the car with me is my partner. Scott Lower. And your name, sir? Brian. Okay. Um, so... Brian, to my understanding, you were called over here. Um, so can you just take me back to this morning and your involvement with Sarah, which is your ex-wife? Yes. Okay. Yes, okay. yes. We've been divorced about a year and a half. Okay. Um, well, I started calling her probably 10.30 or so. He says here he called at 10.30, but earlier he said he called at 11.30. Detectives will look at his phone to verify the time. It's her day to pick up the kid, but okay. it doesn't always happen. One or two days a week, maybe she gets them. Um, so, um, Out of the five? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So, and what um, do you think, like every other day you're, you're supposed to? Well, we're or? supposed to. She's Monday, Tuesday, on Wednesday, Thursday, and then we alternate Friday through Sunday. So I was supposed to. I was actually my lawyer back a couple of weeks ago because so I was looking to get a change because she, she can never stick to it. There's always some reason why. So it's general that I start calling her around to find out if she's actually going to get him, even though yesterday she told me she would. We again hear Ms. Boone is unreliable, so much so that even though she confirmed the previous day that she would pick up her son, the ex knows he still has to call on the day to make sure she's going to follow through. We're talking about picking up a child, not the dry cleaning. We hear that she doesn't keep her word, doesn't do what she has agreed to do, and that this is a pattern of behavior. It appears that her treatment of others, including her own child, is based on what she wants, not on what they want or need. So I started calling her about 10.30. Um, never got any answer until... <laughs> So I finally got a hold of her at 12.49. Um, and did she call you or you call her? No, I, I called her. I, I called her at um, 11.25. I did that twice. I always call twice because generally she's asleep or whatever. And, um, then I called her two more times at 12.21. And then I called her again at 12.49. And that's when she answered. Okay. Um, freaking out, saying that George was dead. And could I please come over? A total of five phone calls. At 12.49, she finally answers. And at that time, she already knows the victim is deceased. We still don't know at what time she unzipped the suitcase. But now we know it was at or earlier than 12.49. Note what we don't hear. We don't hear that she said anything to Brian about trying CPR. We don't hear that she has called 911. We already know she hadn't called 911. The absence of mention of CPR doesn't mean it didn't happen, but we're not hearing that it did. So, um, I told her you need to call the police. Mm -hmm. And, um, went and, uh, uh, got the dog, my dog in his, uh, crate and everything, um, while Brian was on the phone with her, he told her to call police. She did not call 911 at this point. She told officers she didn't know what to do. It's unbelievable to not know to call 911. And now we learn Brian told her to call even before he left his house. And start heading over here. She called me again at 1254 asking if I was going to be coming over if I had left yet. At 12.54, 
She is still not on the phone with 911. She's not doing CPR if she's calling Brian. Her focus is on what she wants and needs. Um, I told her I had already left. I was be there in a couple minutes. So I got here, uh, knocked on the door, uh, walked in the, just right in the front entrance area, um, told her once again, you need to call the police. Was she on the phone with anyone when you not saw yet. her? Not yet. Not okay. yet. She was shaking. She was trying to get herself something to drink because she was just, like, freaking out. So that's when she got on the phone and called, and I said, I'm going outside because I don't really want to be in here right now. So I came outside, and I sat in my car, and so people showed up, and it's kind of where we've gone from there. So Instead of doing CPR or calling 911, Boone was getting herself a drink. Okay, so... You called her about five or six times before she answered. Yeah, which completely normal. Normal to you. Okay. Um, the rotation real quick. So Monday, Tuesday, she'll have them. Wednesday, Thursday, you'll have them. And then you rotate each weekend. Yeah, well, it's, like it's every other weekend. How it's supposed to work. Generally, it's one or two times, maybe a week. I, I think she had him last Tuesday was the last time he was actually over here. Um, and spent the night? Yes. Okay. It's probably another week before that. What's your son's name? Um, you think he stayed here last Tuesday? Yes. Okay. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was last Tuesday. Okay, so you technically have him more than she does. Is, oh, yeah. is that where you're getting Yeah, that, okay. that's that's why I said I was going so to So even though that's how it's supposed change. to be, you still have him? Yeah, there, there's, it's a not a good day, George is in a bad mood, <laughs> or whatever else reason. I, I think sometimes just she wants to stay up and drink and can't really do that. She's got to wake up and take him to school the next day. Right. Any number of different reasons. So. Sounds like her care for and commitment to her child is dependent on what's convenient for her. But, okay. How long have you known Sarah? Um, since, let's see here, I was probably... Three or so when we met. Oh, wow. Something like that. Since you were 23? Yeah. Yeah, so probably, I mean, 20 years. Uh, we dated for quite a while. And then um, got married, whatever it was, 12, 13 years ago, something like that. Well, I guess 12, 13 years ago before the divorce. So I guess like 14, 15 ago, something like that, maybe. Okay. What can you tell me about her? Um... I, I don't, it, she's generally not, she, she can get a bit violent when she drinks. Um, not to this kind of extent. If right, I, yeah. I don't know what happened exactly. But, right. No, um, I'm just looking for you. But know, um, that, 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 that was part of it. Um, the alcohol has gotten worse and worse and worse over the years. Um, that's one of the main reasons why I divorced her. Um, I just couldn't deal with that. I mean, it got to the point where, I mean, on weekdays, she'd go out, and I guess the George person is one of the people she had met. Because um, I separated at one point, I went over to my parents' house to live for a few months. And I guess she met him over at the pool place or something like that. But I would come back, we were in therapy, trying to work it out. And I mean, on, on a weeknight, when he's got school the next day, I've got work the next day. I mean, she was out until 3 o'clock in the morning when the bar closes, and She'd bring people back over on the back porch. I mean, one time, some random person walked in my house and started screaming for Sarah at 3.34 o'clock in the morning when we're trying to sleep. I, mean, I just couldn't get over it. So did you used to live here? No, no, no. no I, I, bought, I bought her out of, out of our house. Okay, okay. I, 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 I... Now we learn that Miss Boone's history of violent behavior and her alcohol issue precedes her relationship with Mr. Torres. While that does not mean Mr. Torres was an angel, it does mean that Ms. Boone cannot blame her behavior on the relationship with the victim. Her pattern of behavior had already been established prior to that relationship. And we're hearing again that she just does whatever she wants, regardless of the impact on other people, including her own family. That Brian bought her out of the house within the last year and a half likely means she got a sum of money or that she's receiving payments. So money shouldn't be a big problem. But it won't be a surprise if we learn her addiction robbed her of that money. 
I was going to just sell it and move because mm-hmm. I kind of want to go back to College Park, which is where I'm from. But right. I thought it would be maybe easier for me if I just bought around and kept that house so we had a little bit of continuancy, kind yeah. of. So that's what I ended up doing. And then she moved right down the street here. So. And how long would you say the alcoholism has been a part of her life? Um, well, I mean, it's always been a part of her life. Um, it seemed to have gotten worse and worse. I, I think more or less kind of since we had I think a lot of it was the fact that she kind of, I guess, maybe felt trapped or something. Okay. That, um, I mean, before that, I mean, whenever she wanted, you're outside having a drink. Oh, I want to go play pool. You go over across the street and play pool for a little bit. Yeah. That, that's not happening anymore when she got a kid. Right. Um, so. How old's your son? He is nine. This is in keeping with everything else we've seen and heard. It does tell us that her issues and behaviors are long standing. They would have been present prior to the birth of the child and only become obvious at that point. I want to make it clear that this is not caused by the child. Ms. Boone's issues were already there. So, um, but I mean, she, she started just getting really angry when she drank a lot, um, she said last night she fell asleep. I, there, there were plenty of times where she just basically passed out from drinking. So, um, so she, you've you've witnessed her pass out from drinking. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, and when she passes out, is she like out cold? Oh, she's out. Like how how difficult would it be to like wake her? Oh, I mean, if if I were to like shake her or something, <laughs> right. I could probably wake her up. But me making a phone call or noise probably wouldn't. Okay. Um, and would she be like in the middle of doing something and just like out cold, or would she no, like it, go to bed? Yeah, and it would just be, be out cold. Yeah, she wouldn't like fall over or anything. It'd be more <laughs> of a lay down, and then she just out. Right. Okay. The detective asks good questions here, and so we learn that Ms. Boone doesn't just fall down and pass out. She first goes to lay down. This is important in respect to her decision to walk away from Mr. Torres and leave him confined. If she'd fallen down and passed out, the story would be different. Having said that, she herself already stated she wanted to make Mr. Torres squirm. She chose to leave him confined and suffering in a situation she knew could kill him, and she walked away. What do you know about her and George's relationship, if anything? Um, it was, it was, I mean, I think she had him arrested like five or six times for domestic violence. I mean, he's stuck a steak knife in the back of her leg one time. We already knew that Mr. Torres was violent toward Miss Boone, and now we're hearing something of how serious it was. The use of a weapon, any weapon, but particularly a deadly weapon, shows you just how dangerous the situation was. I'm not excusing or justifying violence on anybody's part. The facts show that this relationship was highly dangerous to Ms. Boone. How that relates to this particular night is a different conversation, and we will likely get to that at a later date. Miss Boone's story is that they were playing and everything was fine, so a straight-up self-defense argument won't work. I want to say something here about how people want to perceive victims and offenders and what is demanded of victims. A lot of people want to see the offender as evil and the victim as good. But we're talking about humans. People are messy. With very few exceptions, nobody is all good or all bad. If that were the case, nobody would get stuck in terrible relationships. We could simply avoid the bad people. And just because a victim has done bad things doesn't mean they should be victimized. Some people want proof that the victim is good and innocent and pure as the driven snow in order to acknowledge they've been victimized and it's wrong. With the exception of babies, no one can live up to that. 
We can confidently say both that Ms. Boone did suffer at Mr. Torres's hands and that Mr. Torres should not have lost his life. These two concepts are not contradictory. Okay, my little rant is over. Let's move on. He's been ar- so has he always been the one that gets arrested, or has she ever been She arrested? was also one of the times. Uh, okay. One of the times both of them were arrested. Um, uh, but all the others have been him. But the very next day, she's in there trying to get it bailed out. So I, right. I don't know. Basically, they get drunk. They get in a fight. She gets upset. She calls the cops. I mean, granted, I mean, I saw lots of black eyes, bruises. On her? Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're hearing about a pattern of IPV against her, as well as evidence that she engaged in similar behavior toward him. That she would go and get him out of jail is common with IPV victims. The research shows that even after suffering severe injuries or after a truly life-threatening incident, victims minimize within the first 24 hours. The window of opportunity for the most effective intervention is at the time of the incident or within the first few hours. Minimization, compartmentalization, and self-blame are ways to cope. This can be baffling and frustrating for family and friends. It's frustrating for police officers and those working in criminal justice who work like mad to put together a solid case only to have the victim recant or enable the offender to violate bail or probation conditions. Instead of seeing this as a sign that the victim doesn't need help, it should be viewed as evidence that the victim is psychologically stuck and is therefore at increased risk. Brian mentioned Ms. Boone had also been arrested. One of the arrests was for strangulation, where she was the aggressor. Mr. Torres didn't want to proceed with charges. Research has consistently shown that choking is a strong predictor of future lethal violence in IPB cases. Strangulation is a strong predictor of homicide and is considered a warning sign. Already we have learned that there was a long-standing pattern of IPV, that both parties were stuck, that the violence was frequent and severe, that potentially lethal means had been used, that there were clear warning signs backed by research of future homicide, and that both parties had addictions and the substance of choice was a disinhibitor. Without strong intervention, it was only a matter of time before one of them was killed. So, I mean, there, there definitely was. Now, Whoever, when you see George as much as you would see him or her, I hardly or ever saw him. You are I, I, I honestly, I didn't like being around either one of them. Right. To be honest, and him more so. So, that's that. um, just I, I, I. I don't know. <laughs> it, it's my ex-wife. Um, she made me really mad with everything. Um, how the whole divorce went down and just, I mean, the way she acted and the way she changed and the way they both are, I mean, what it's done and everything else. I just, I, he's, he's, not, he's, not, he's nobody I cared to see. I mean, let me put it right. that way. I mean, it's not like I really went out of my way to, like, I, it's just when you guys do drop offs or anything, is it always through the school, or would you like have to come here and see them, or, or no? No, it's it's you pretty much always during the school. Some, okay. some now sometimes she would come over or something like that. Um, sometimes he would be driving, but I mean he would just stay in the car. Or she would come in, so I mean I w- really wouldn't see him. So it's not like you have like conversations with yeah. George. Okay. Um, no, I mean there's I mean maybe a few times when they drunkenly called me at night because. She was telling me she needed to escape because whatever's going on. or She's put him on the phone, but I don't know. They would call him. I note that they, it's not just her. And she would put Torres on the phone. If she's calling and or putting him on the phone, we know that at least at those times, Torres was not preventing her from calling for help. That's something we look for in assessments. 
If the offender disables the phone or acts to prevent the victim from calling for help, that's an aggravating factor. When Brian refers to her needing to escape, we don't know if that means she just wants a breather or if she's trying to escape from violence that's occurring or if she thinks things are going to escalate and she's avoiding that. What we are hearing is that she does feel she has the option to escape, that she has used this to cope in the past, and that Torres does not stop her. It's common for perpetrators to prevent the victim from getting help and prevent the victim from walking out. In fact, a victim's attempt to walk away is seen as a loss of control for the perpetrator and frequently causes an escalation in violence. When you hear about a victim remaining in the house with an abuser, often this is why. The victim knows that walking away will trigger an escalation. That does not appear to be the case here. This may be an important detail to remember for future reference, depending on what her defense is. When's like the last incident that you recall of there being like a domestic dispute between her and George? Um... I mean, she told me, like, a week ago she had to escape from the house and wanted me to come pick her up. I told her I wasn't going to because I, I, I'm i just tired of it happening. I right. mean, it was midnight. I mean, child's trying to sleep and just... Right. Honestly, I don't always believe her when she said these things were going on. And I, She called you? Yeah. Okay. yeah. And I mean, apparently she went back inside and slept well. So in a fine mood the next day. I guess didn't really remember calling me, so... It, I don't know if it was, was it just if it was just a she wanted to come over to I don't know she keeps on trying to come over to like hang out or something like that or um, she'll come over to spend time with Lucas rather than actually just having him over here like she, she's supposed to but she wants to come over there and play with him and so um, I'm not sure how real that was um, last time I know there was an actual physical com- confrontation. Uh, um, it's probably been a little while because this last time uh, George got arrested, I know he, he was on free trial, whatever, something. I don't know. He had a parole officer. He had a domestic violence class. He was like, so that's the last time. The, the basically the last time he was arrested was the last physical altercation that you recall. I think so. And it looks like escape doesn't necessarily mean there was violence, and it sounds like there have not been incidents for some time. However, the absence of a reported incident doesn't mean the absence of any incident, and the psychological aspects don't change quickly. And there can be abuses and power and control dynamics which don't involve physical altercations. Add to that addictions and personalities. Importantly, though, we're hearing there has not been an escalation, and there has been, at least, a reduction in frequency and severity of incidents. It sounds like Mr. Torres was working to change. Sadly, Ms. Boone needed to change, too, and she didn't. I I don't know for sure, but I think so. Can you have any idea what year or month that may have been? Um... Back a few months, maybe? A few months ago? Yeah, something like that, maybe. I don't think it was incredibly long. Okay. Like around the holidays of last year, before the holidays? Um, I think it was probably before the holidays. I'm trying to remember. Okay. Because oddly enough, it was, it was like a three-week period where she actually had Lucas all the time she was supposed to because he was in jail for a month or something like that. Okay. Because they wouldn't let him out. <laughs> yeah. And you said when she drinks that she can get physically aggressive? She can. I mean, she, she did it to me a lot where she'd hit me and stuff like that. I mean, she, she's tiny. I mean, yeah. She, what, she, what do you mean hit, though? Like, open hand smack you or, like, try to punch she would, you? Yeah, she'd punch me. I mean, more arms. She she many, many times would use her claws. I mean, I, I had scratches on my neck at times, on my arms. I mean, things like that where she'd dig with her claws. Okay. Um, I... I I never got that drunk, and I had restraint. I never touched her back. I right. think George didn't have that restraint, and at times he would hurt her back. So for all, for all I know, all the times he got arrested, she started it. I wasn't there, so. But I know she could get violent at times. Okay. 
but I mean, it, it, I don't know, it, it, it wasn't anything too, I don't know, too much. I mean, just. <laughs> right, yeah, I mean, you, you don't feel like she was a huge threat. I no, assuming, no, right? no. Yeah, like you could handle yourself. Yes. Again, Ms. Boone's history of violent behavior predates her ever meeting Mr. Torres. Not only was she violent, it was enough to leave scratches and bruises on her husband. You can hear how Brian minimizes the violence he suffered. This is common among all victims and especially common with male victims. The fact that he is a man does not make an assault on him acceptable. You hear him agreeing that he could handle himself. This too is common, and it leads male victims and those around them to believe they are safe when they are not. I'm hoping that every man listening and everyone listening who has men in their life who they love is really hearing this. Violence against men should be taken more seriously than it is. And the assumption that a man suffering IPV is safe just because he's a man is incorrect. Blind acceptance of this assumption too often ends in tragedy. Um, does she drink daily? I think pretty much. Okay. Do you know, like, her drink of choice? Oh, that would be vodka. Vodka. Or wine, but vodka is the big one. And does she or George have a job? No. Um, She hasn't worked for over two years. Um, Well, I guess you could maybe call when he's got a job. He he worked at the Ace Hardware up across the street here. Okay. um, Which is now going out of business. Okay. Um, He he kind of off and on worked there. When he did work, it was 15, 20 hours a week, something like that. I mean, my alimony and stuff basically pays for where they live. So, I mean, they, they... didn't need a ton, but I mean, she she was always calling to borrow money, and uh, but it, yeah, it's been like two years since she got a job. She keeps on telling me she's looking, she's always finding the good opportunities and everything. But so Brian bought her out of the matrimonial home, and he pays alimony, but she still asks to borrow money from him. She claims to be looking for work, but she's not actually worked since before the divorce. We are seeing more about her irresponsibility. While Mr. Torres is only working part-time, he is working. Sounds like he was losing his job and income, so that would add some stress to the household. Uh, did When you came over here, I know you said that she called you freaking out, saying he was dead. Did she give you any more, like, just why or she, how? She, or... She, she told me that... Um... They were playing last night or something, and he got in the suitcase, and she fell asleep. Okay. That's all she told me, so I don't know anything beyond that. Okay. Uh, and I really didn't talk to her much, because I came inside, I told her, you need to call the police, and then I came back out, and I think she went on the back porch to smoke a cigarette, so I didn't even really talk with her much. <laughs> oh, like she was going outside to smoke? Did you see her take a cigarette? Yeah, she was going outside with a... Well, I also know when the cops showed up, she kept on telling them she had a cigarette burning out there and she needed to go put it out. Okay. But they were keeping her away from stuff, I guess. Right. Okay. Confirmation that she went out for a drink and a smoke before calling 911. That means she wasn't doing CPR. If she made any attempt at CPR prior to answering the call from Brian, it's clear that she abandoned it. If you go back and listen to the 911 call, it doesn't sound like she's actually doing CPR then either. Her statements to the responding officer that she started CPR immediately were self-serving. And because we're hearing the fell asleep excuse again, I will again point out that she chose to confine Mr. Torres. She admitted to intending that he suffer, and she chose to walk away while knowing her action could cause his death. She intentionally did these things before she fell asleep. But, um, yeah, she wanted me to come back there with her. I was like, I'm going out here. I be in here, so. Right. Um, and that's when she went to call 911? 
Well, she called 911 while I was in there. I was standing right in the foyer area. Okay. Um, and, I mean, it was apparently a pretty quick conversation, and that's when she started to go that way, and I just told her I'm going out front. So. Okay. 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 So they were playing, and she went upstairs and went to bed. I don't know After where she, she went. She, she just told me she went to sleep. Or she went to sleep. Okay. You don't know where. I don't know where. <laughs> I didn't ask more questions. I leave that to you guys. Yeah. <laughs> That's odd. He said it was a quick conversation with 911, and he went out front as she was headed out back. Something is off here. What really happened? Has he got it wrong? In the first few seconds of the 911 call, Ms. Boone can be heard saying, don't leave. That would be when Brian was going out the front door and she was headed out back. Had she gone for her drink and smokes while she was on the phone with 911 and Brian figured the call was done? Is that why there was a cigarette still burning outside? Because she was out for her smoke and drink while she talked to them and then ran back inside when she heard them arrive so that they would find her doing CPR. But during the 911 call, she screamed because the body made a noise. Tell me in the comments what you think of this. <laughs> well, I was in the foyer. Not today. Oh, other than today. Before today? Um. <sighs> Or if I've been in there, I haven't even really been over here lately. Um, so it's been a long time. It's probably been at least weeks, maybe. Does he play baseball or anything like that? Um, we've tried to get him into sports. He's not a big sports person, really. Um, Did you ever play baseball? Um, he didn't play baseball. Um, uh, well, I mean, I had like a t ball set and stuff like that, and we. Play catch. Is it like a plastic t ball set or what kind of equipment? Oh, well, no, this is when he was like three years old. It was a little plastic thing I had in the backyard. Did you ever buy him any baseball bats or anything? Um, I bought one for over here that Sarah said for um, Lucas and George to like play with or something. That was. I was like a year ago or something, maybe. What kind of bat was it? Was it a wood bat? Yeah, it's, it was a wooden bat. Um, like a, I think it's like a junior size thingy. I don't know. It's something that I look like kind of for his height or something. I think. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> um. Would you mind if I took a picture of your call log to show? Sure, sure, sure. sure. Um. That you've. All Do you just want to see hers or? Like zoomed in on hers, so you can see all of those. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. okay. Um, so I see starting from today. Um, I know her phone. Did you text with her at all today? Not today. I don't think I did today at all. Um, no, that was last night. She was drunkenly texting me. <laughs> last what night? Time? Yeah. What time? Um, that was eleven o'clock at night. Either. I'll say it was Sunday. Was it Sunday? Oh, that's Saturday. Never mind. Saturday. That, that was Saturday night when I was watching the baseball game. Okay. Um, yesterday, which is that, when I, she said she, her account was in the negative, <laughs> so I transferred her a little bit of money to get her out of the negative. She said you, oh, that was the morning. Okay, so she thanked you at 11.56 that morning. Yeah. Right? Sorry. Okay. What's the last thank you? What time? Okay, so just a few yeah, times. yeah, and then that one at twelve oh one. Okay, so afternoon, Sunday afternoon. Yeah. Okay. And then the calls. Do you need like? Yeah, I'm gonna. Okay. Yep, I'll start from the top. Where it has her information. And that's okay. fine. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. <coughs> Um, um, has this ever told you anything about her, like, witnessing anything between her and George? He's, he's heard arguments and things like that. Okay. Um, he's not a big fan of staying over here, honestly. Okay. Um, just because they, 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 they 
get in arguments and stuff like that. I don't think they've ever um, had a physical fight in front of him. Okay. But I know there's been arguments he's told me about. Okay. Um, there have been times where I think things were starting to get to that point, mm-hmm. and she has called me to come pick him up. Okay. And bring him back over to my house. So. She's generally um, pretty good about um, having me come get him, if, um, which leads to me not having a wife because I can't ever do anything. Right. <laughs> so right. I can't go anywhere because I'm too worried about something happening and me having to be over here quickly. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, do you have anything else? Hey, do you know if she's ever had any issues with drugs in the past? To my knowledge, she's never really been a drug person. She's big on alcohol. But um, I don't think she's ever done. I mean, I think she told me like one time, like back before we got divorced, that at um, I don't know this bar thing over there across the street near the Walgreens, whatever it's called. Okay. I, I've never been there, but somebody gave her a little bit of cocaine like two years ago or something like that. But I've never known her to do drugs. What about George? Um, <laughs> No clue whatsoever. Um, that she's never she's complained never, you know, to you? No, no. That's not to say these things don't happen, because um, I try to keep myself out of and away from that. them in general. But right. Okay, is there anything else that you think is important for us to know that we have not asked you? Um, About either George or Sarah? I, I, don't, I don't think so. Um... When, um, I mean, you guys have been separated for, what do you say, five? We've been divorced about a year and a half. We've been, we were separated a good eight months before that or so. So. And we had been separated one other time before that, before we got back together and were trying to do therapy, which didn't work at all. So. How long has she been living in this apartment? <laughs> um, ever since we got divorced. So. A year and a half ago? Um, no. No, 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 longer than that then, um, because I took over the house. I moved in there, and she moved here, um, because I told her I was buying her out of the house, so I guess it has been longer than that. Um, I think she just said she renewed, so maybe just past two years? That may be right. I think she said she's been here like four years. She's been with George. I don't know. I don't remember what she said. Yeah, she, she was, she with, she was with George before we were divorced, so. Yeah. Um, and any time that, uh, that you recall when you guys were together, um, and she would be drunk, um, did she always, like, resort to getting angry? Like, is she an angry junk, or would she, like... She, her, her main problem is it, is she can't stop. Okay. I mean, she can't go out and have a glass of wine with dinner. Right. That's not the things you can do because when she starts drinking, she will continue drinking basically until she, she out. Yeah. Would she were if she were to be drunk, would she like want to play games with you? Like, did you guys? Oh, there, like, yeah. There's a there's a really good period where she is very good, but then she drinks past that and she gets into the angry bit. Okay. Can you just raise your right hand for me? Do you promise and swear everything we've talked about has been true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? Yes. yes. Okay, this ends our recording. 15, 52 hours. Ms. Boone said she'd been with Torres for three and a half years. Brian reports he and Ms. Boone separated only eight months prior to the divorce, a year and a half ago. I'll let you do the math. Just a reminder that alcohol does not impart new personality traits but it does disinhibit what is already there. Next, we hear a follow-up phone call between Brian and the detective. Today's date is March 1st, 2020. The time now is approximately 1641 hours. This is in reference to Orange County case number 20-017904. I am on the phone with, can you state your name, sir? Brian and um, I have a couple follow-up questions that I wanted to ask Brian Boone um, in reference to this case. Um, Brian, just give me your date of birth for me. Okay. And do you promise and swear everything we're going to talk about is going to be true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? Yes. 
Yes. Okay. So we had a conversation um, about the incident and your involvement a few days ago, earlier this week, I believe on Tuesday. And after looking through Sarah's call logs, I noticed that she called you um, on February 23rd, which would be um, the Sunday night at uh-huh. around 2346 hours, which in that's military time, but in normal time, that's 1146 hours. Do you yes. recall that phone call? Hmm. Brian has been imprecise, but this goes a little further than that. He's trying to have as little involvement as possible. It's hard to believe that he wouldn't recall getting a phone call so close to the time of the victim's death. I I, I do, well, somewhat. I, I was asleep when she called. Um, uh, so she woke me up. I was half asleep when I was talking to her. Um, she did sound very inebriated. Okay. Um, I, I don't remember what all she I'm kind of used to her calling drunk late at night and things like that so it it didn't phase me as anything out of the ordinary i basically just kind of got her off the phone and told her i'm going back to sleep and i'll talk to you tomorrow okay um you said that she sounded inebriated like she was drunk yeah i mean she didn't sound like i don't it's hard. I was half asleep at the time. Um, I don't think I remember hearing anything bad in the background or anything that would, would have caused me concern, but I don't really remember it that well. Okay. But she was under the influence of alcohol based off of your knowledge of just knowing her and knowing when and when, and when she's not under the influence. Yeah, yeah. As soon as I heard her start talking, I, I almost kind of just zoned out away from it because she says all kinds of nonsense when she does this late at night and just I was trying to get her off the phone so I could go back and say yes I'm sorry I'm on the phone right now okay so do you remember her saying anything specifically about George um I don't think so I don't really remember I I I really don't remember much of the conversation, honestly. Okay. I appreciate it. Um, okay. And the phone conversation lasted for a little over two minutes, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, may have been, yeah. Okay. Um, and you said that it's kind of normal for her to call you um, late at night or just kind of whenever she's under the influence and she's kind of just yeah. babbling on and you have to try and get her off the phone. Yeah, you don't yeah it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a thing that happens. Okay. Um, okay, so you can't remember anything specific about what she may or may not have said, but she did sound inebriated. Does that sound correct? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and you couldn't hear anything in the background? Um, I'm not fit. As far as, like, arguing or no. yelling or anything like that, you couldn't hear any of that? I don't think so. Okay. Do you know do you know where she was located? Did she ever say? Um, I I was assuming she was at home. Okay, but she didn't say. I mean she she didn't have a lot of money. She didn't really go out anywhere, so I assumed she was at home. Okay. But you wouldn't know where in the house she may have been. No. Okay, she didn't give you that information. Okay. Not not that I remember it. I it's possible she said something. I don't really remember, though. Okay. Um, all right. Is there anything else that you think is important for me to know about that phone conversation? Um, I don't think so. Does that typically... Do you guys talk often? Like, in a day's uh, time? Like, do you guys talk daily? More than I would like. Um... <laughs> Normally, um, anytime I'm calling her, it's to find out if she's actually going to be picking the child up like she's supposed to. Right. Um, uh, like that next morning with me constantly calling. Um, right. She'll call to talk to or sometimes when she's drunk or she needs me, she wants me to come pick her up because she's scared of George or, I mean, any number of different things. 
Okay, you're kind of like her call person, like she. Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's gotten very old over the last couple of years. So I, I've started to just kind of ignore what she's saying and just try to get her gone as soon as possible. Right. Because I mean, honestly, for a long time, I tried to help her out, give her refuge, get away from him, and she just kept bringing him back, and I eventually just gave up on the situation. So. Right. Okay. All right, do you promise and swear everything that we have talked about has been true and accurate to the best of your knowledge? Yes. Okay, this ends the recording at 1647 hours. Miss Boone's location in the house at this time, 2346, can help confirm the sequence of events as well as the timeline. But there's something more here. If she left Torres downstairs in the suitcase, then went upstairs, and then made a phone call, she was not so drunk that she couldn't help but pass out. Now, given her choices to take revenge on the victim and then walk away, the fell asleep excuse doesn't work anyway, but her making a phone call after leaving Mr. Torres there further erodes her already invalid excuse. He said, scared. That's an important word here. It's also important to note she felt the ability or the freedom to leave and was willing to ask for help when she wanted help. But on this night, according to Ms. Boone, she was not scared. They were playing and she wanted to make the victim squirm. That's all for this one. Thank you for listening.